Hello everyone. Firstly, I would like to thank Stick Committee for inviting me to be keynote speaker at this art and industry online conference today. Also thanks very much for all the attendees listening in to my talk. This is the first time presenting an online talk to a virtual room full of people. Today I want to talk about my most recent work as artist and resident at Nig Energy Park in the Cromarty Firth, North East Highlands, during this year, 2020. This subject will be intertwined with an overview of my previous works. I am still at Nig, so you will be the first to see the artworks which I have been doing over the past months. I am most known for documenting the North Sea energy industry and as a reminder of the geographical layout of the North Sea, here is a map which marks out the central and northern oil and gas offshore fields and the renewable energy projects within the Scottish waters which I have been associated with. You will hear me talk about Murchison, Brent, European Marine Energy Centre, Beatrice Wind Farm Demonstrator Project and I've also marked a red star where I am, Achavandra, near Dornoch and the Dornoch Firth, and a blue star for Nig Energy Park at the mouth of the Cromarty Firth. For me, it is important to record these industrial landscapes, which has shaped and changed our world using old-fashioned pencils and sketch pads. Official corporate new media technology dominates the portrayal of this industry, controlled by the companies involved. Artists see and observe the world differently, creating different outlooks and personal impressions. At times I am a fly on the wall in these remote, extreme environments, privileged to be writing my on-site diaries and drawing my visual experiences. Very few artists have experienced and recorded the North Sea oil industry at first hand. Three interesting all-female made one-off residency visits offshore. Faye Godwin in the 1970s, Kate Downey in 1988 and Fiona Carlyle in 2005. I have now come full circle returning in 2020 to Nig Energy Park. This area is full of my childhood memories and it was here that as a young artist in the 1980s I drew massive oil platform jackets for the North Sea oil fields being fabricated by a workforce at times of up to four and a half thousand men. I want to set the scene and take us back to the 1970s, my childhood where I was born and brought up on the Black Isle. It is where, during this time, this area's social and geographical landscape changed exorbitantly. With the discovery of North Sea oil, its boom hit with a bang, and it became my contemporary highland landscape and environment. Three massive construction yards were sited on the highland mainland, Nig Ardesir, flanking the Black Isle on either side, Kishorn and Wester Ross, with Arnish on the island of Lewis, all in a space of a couple of years, thousands of workers from outside this area flocked to these yards. Also hundreds of local people rolled up. The Highlanders had to adapt to this radical change big money wage packets, mass influx of outsiders, housing developments and with it came fast cars. 784 Scottish Theatre Company's touring production in 1973-4, The Cheviot, The Stag and The Black Black Oil made a huge impression on me as a child when it was performed at a local village hall. It was a synopsis of our social history told by artist performers. It was a wonderful history lesson 
created in performance and song, because during my school years, we learnt all about every other European country's history and not our own. During my undergraduate years at Grey School of Art, Aberdeen, which is located on the outskirts of the city, my higher art education was far removed from the oil and gas industrial activities. Urban and rural landscapes were granite buildings and open countryside and hills. There were no organised drawing trips to the harbour or encouragement to look at or connect to this industry, Aberdeen being the oil capital of Europe. As art students, we existed in an unreal bubble. Thanks to a commission in 1984 by Stirling Shipping Company Glasgow, whilst I was a recent young art graduate, I sailed out on the Stirling Teal, one of their cargo supply vessels, for a week visiting oil fields. This changed my artistic life. It had all the visual drama for an artist, the scale of the man-made constructions out in the harsh, remote, natural environments, a tough man's machine world versus nature. I began to draw in these liminal environments where no other artist had been. I was allowed a glimpse into the secret world and it all fell into place in a way with influences from my own background and childhood. In 20 years time, all 400 North Sea offshore installations will be decommissioned and removed. What will take their place? Vast offshore wind farms and tidal turbine farms. It's already happening now. Doggerland, a recent fiction novel written by Ben Smith, is set in such a future, describing a worker caught in the eeriness of these vast offshore energy farms. The general public have always found it hard to grasp and visualise of what goes on out there in the production fields. These installations represent an aspect of our contemporary age which many people have not thought about or have tried to ignore, that of the age of oil. Compared to other heavy industries like the shipyards, for example, on the Clyde, Glasgow and North East England, they became part of their cityscape. People worked, lived and breathed these yards. A whole community culture grew up around them and when they were gone, romantic, nostalgic reminiscences have taken their place. With the oil and gas industry, people feel disconnected and not part of their lives, even if their partners are working in this industry. I take a quote from a chapter which I've written for an academic publication called Cold Water Oil, which is coming out soon. And in it I write, Primarily it is the people and their work locations which are set in a time warp with no real visual time gauge, just sea, horizon and sky. It is at the cost of our natural environment. These man-made metal islands are in parallel, artificial worlds, comparable perhaps to confined, futuristic space stations. The workforce's expansive and colourful PPE, the clothes that they wear to work in, capture my imagination from deep sea divers gear to survival suits. In order to gain access to these installations, one not only has to convince the owners, the oil companies, one needs to gain your offshore ticket, the Vantage card, which means going through Hewitt, Bosiet and Mist survival training, which most people dread unless you are a fit water enthusiast. These certificates need to be updated every four years. My first offshore trip 
was a packed whirlwind day trip to the 40s field and then my first time staying for a week on board a platform was the ill-fated Piper Alpha, almost one year before the disaster of 1988 where the platform exploded and 169 men were killed, still the world's worst oil disaster. I subsequently went on to sculpt the Piper Alpha Memorial, which is sited at Hazelhead Park, Aberdeen. Over the years I have visited many offshore platforms, mostly in the northern North Seas. My written diaries are crucial in describing my artistic adventures, an intrinsic extension to my artworks. For further reading on this subject and my offshore and onshore site visits, there are three publications you may be interested in reading. Oil Work, North Sea Diaries, 1986 to 2004, Berlin publication, which is still available online, second hand. Beatrice Works, Aberdeen Art Gallery and Museums Publication and Age of Oil National Museum Scotland Publication covering work from 2006 to 2017 which is available on the NMS online shop. And so too the NIG Energy Park Residency. I found myself returning to where it all started off for me, the Cromarty Firth. NEP site originally was the Highland Fabricators Yard, established by Brown and Root and Wimpy United States companies in 1972. One and a half million cubic yards of sand and sandstone were bulldozed and taken away to create this yard. In the late 1970s, an oil terminal was sited next to this yard to store crude oil arriving by subsea pipe from the Beatrice oil field, 30 miles out in the Murray Firth, ready for tanker pickup. Incidentally, I visited Beatrice oil field in 2018, just months before it was shut down and abandoned. So would it happen today? Jobs versus nature, a perpetual conundrum. I can't remember what Nig's landscape was like pre-1972, where part of the site had old First and Second World War Admiralty buildings, and this land, vast sand dunes and sandy beaches brimming with wildlife. I mentioned that the oil boom transformed this area, but looking back in the early 20th century, the Royal Navy established a base in this firth until the 1970s. In 1907, this firth welcomed 14,500 men, and with them came 20 torpedo boats, 12 battleships, 6 cruisers and 2 scout ships. Thousands more were stationed during the First and Second World War years. And it seems that this firth has always been an attraction for maritime activities of all sorts throughout the ages. NEP is now owned by Global Energy Group, and the CEO, being a local Invergordon man, Roy McGregor, is chairman of Ross County Football Club, known as the Staggies. As I walk around this site, there are moments of being very aware of what has gone on before. 50 years of activity and of my own experiences here whilst drawing when I was a young art student. Almost two generations of workers have trampled this ground before. People I knew from my own childhood worked here, building massive steel platform jackets, the first being for the 40s field, the first field I visited offshore. This is where I drew in 1986-7 and returned again in 2006-7 to draw and document the Beatrice Offshore Deep Water Wind Demonstrator Project. This demonstrator project 
was a world first in offshore wind and precursor to the £2.6 billion Beatrice offshore wind farm now in the Murray Firth. My NEP residency duration is a year and one would think that leaves plenty of time for me to draw on site. But there is so much activity that it is difficult to keep up with it all. The main activities on site are the refit of the Well Safe Guardian rig for decommissioning work, the East Murray offshore wind farm and Maygen Atlantis underwater tidal turbine. During the first three months, the pre-Covid months, I was busy drawing the Well Safe Guardian rig and getting to know the crew on board, whilst it was being transformed from an exploration rig into a multi-purpose installation for decommissioning work capping whales and whale abandonment. This site is full of industrial activity and very exposed to the elements, so to draw outside for long periods of time is potentially dangerous with heavy vehicle activities and weather exposure. So I got permission to stationary position my car in good drawing spots I basically have the freedom of driving almost anywhere I want within reason, then drawing in comfort and ease. To get on board the Well Safe Guardian, one had to climb up a scaffolding stairway of 20 levels and 200 steps. So plenty of stops admiring the view was a priority whilst ascending. I was looking forward to spending time on board drawing and interviewing the crew after the rig's refit was completed, then moved and anchored out into the Cromarty Firth at the end of March. Excited about staying on board and waking up to the views of looking down the Firth with all the cold and hot stacked rigs, landscape all around. But that all came to an abrupt end. And with lockdown, I was no longer allowed on site at NIG, nor allowed on board the Well Safe Guardian. And during lockdown, I worked on my large working drawings, such as this one, back here in my studio. I kept in touch with NIG, and on May the 2nd, I was allowed back on site for the first heavy transport vessel arrival, the Osprey carrying eight subsea jackets from Dubai. It was very exciting to witness this sight. As it sailed in, I looked down from the Nig Suter's Hill, the headland at the mouth of the Cromarty Firth. In total, 103 subsea jackets will be brought in by sea to Nig, some by barge from Newcastle or by heavy transport vessels from Dubai. Sadly, these jackets were not fabricated in this country. All the jackets were built in Dubai and Belgium. At NIG, these jackets are offloaded, inspected and made ready for the massive Jackap crane ship, Sea Jacks Scylla. She lifts the jackets onto her deck and sails out to the Murray Firth and places each one onto their dedicated seabed spot. The scale of these structures and the jackets, symmetrical raw steel structures with acidic lemon yellow coloured tops, is a new imagery for me. Watching the operation of moving these 2000 plus tan jackets off the vessels and onto the quayside using giant SPMTs, self-propelled modular transporters, remotely manoeuvring these giant structures, just like dinky toys. A selection of sketchbook drawings you see here are precursors for creating large coloured works. Meanwhile, in Shop 1, an exciting renewable energy machine has been built destined for Japan, the Meijen Atlantis Tidal Turbine. Its seabed test site is located in the Pentland Firth between the island of Stroma and the Caithness coast. 
Witnessing and being allowed access to draw this machine is a privilege and there's exciting shapes to draw. Drawing this machine reminded me of test site visits to EMEC, the European Marine Energy Centre off the Orkney Isles coast. And in the slide you can see wave and tidal prototypes being tested. In the top, Wellow Penguin, the tidal prototype, and Palamus, known as the sea snake, a wave prototype. On NIG's quayside areas, many vessels dock either for refuelling, change of crew, or for picking up fabricated structures for offshore, like my watercolour sketch here picking up the Atlantis tidal turbine. Again, being able to draw these deep sea vessels on the quayside is exciting, their design, colour and scale. This reminds me of my epic voyage last year in June 2019 on board the largest construction vessel in the world, the Pioneering Spirit, up to the northern North Seas to lift Brent Bravo topside by a single lift, 25,000 tonnes in nine seconds. These are some of the quick sketches I did on board during that journey. I still have to work more on my large working drawings from that trip. It is fascinating to watch the corporate company's old films about this yard, filmed during the 1970s and 80s. I am also taking film footage and I will create a series of short films about NEP 2020. You can view my previous short films on the National Museum of Scotland website, which I created with the editing assistance from Mick O'Donnell for the Age of Oil Turing exhibition. I want to briefly read a quote from a BP corporate produced film, Sea Area 40s, circa 1975, which, would you believe, won a BAFTA award. Its script, now very dated, is typical of its day, using metaphors invoking nature for their cause. The builders stand as if on a forest floor. High above are the boughs which must never break. Higher still, steel branches to support the drilling platforms. Steel acorn, boy marker on the sea's surface where they must plant steel oak, which becomes Highlander, 30,000 tonnes of steel in the 40s field. Drawing from the inside of my car, I began to notice the seabird life, unperturbed by this noisy industrial works going on. The eider ducks return every year to nest on the tiny artificial rocky sea defence shoreline surrounding part of this yard. To my amazement, arctic terns began to appear and nest in the yard's gravel tracks and heaps, dive bombing anyone who came near. A colony of at least a couple of a hundred. Seagulls, cormorants and a friendly visiting seal, I have been entranced by this wildlife and have drawn many sketches and filmed these nesting birds. They are tiny remnants of nature clinging on. These images will play a large part in my finished works. And due to Covid, there are many restrictions on site. The main one, which I feel is a great gap in my work, is communicating with the workers. I am not as yet allowed to draw any individuals close at hand. And in a way, these birds have bridged that loss. I quote here from Helen MacDonald's own observations of birds in her most recent book, Vesper Flights, about similar environments to Nig. What we are watching is a small feathered rebuke to our commonplace notion that nature exists only in places other than our own. 
an assumption that seems always one step towards turning our back on the natural world, abandoning it as if something disappearing or already lost. At times of difficulty, watching birds ushers you into a different world where no words need to be spoken. Finally, I want to briefly mention this industry's contemporary artefacts for museum collection. For your interest in further reading, Ellie Swinbank, Curator of Technology at National Museum Scotland, has recently written an interesting article, Collecting and Displaying the Decommissioning of North Sea Oil and Gas at National Museum Scotland. And whilst on board platforms about to be shut down and broken up, I do self-initiated, or sometimes self-inflicted, reckeys, and have managed to save some interesting items, collaborations with National Museum Scotland and Aberdeen Maritime Museum. Collecting, for example, Murchison's 10-metre flare tip for the National Museum Scotland. And Murchison's drill floor mats for Aberdeen Maritime Museum. Both these are brutal, iconic symbols of our fossil fuel age. It's not always the big showy artefacts that are the stars of the show. One favourite is the tea flower, a unique homemade apparatus which was used for carrying six coffee cups at once on board the Brent Delta, which is now gone. Hopefully, Shell UK will kindly gift this artefact to a Scottish museum. And as an end note, seeing the conference's theme is art and industry, and during this pandemic, it is good to dream. And I would like to leave you with this interesting thought. I read recently in The Guardian about Centrale Monte Martini Museum in Rome highlighted by Mary Beard as one of her favourites. Some of you may know of it or have even visited. She writes a collection of first-rate ancient sculpture set in a disused power station that still has some machinery. Placing museum artefacts and art pieces in industrial environments is certainly not a new and unique idea for museum practice. But finding an industrial environment like a decommissioned rig and creating an installation full of artworks, now that would be a great project to do. Thank you.